Very good. Good evening, Saucer Yacht Club members. This is the continuation of our uh, speaker lecture series. Uh, my name is Tom Kowalski, and I've been organizing this for a number of years. We're very privileged this evening to have Tony Johnson speaking to us. He is an accomplished sailor. Uh, he has circumnavigated the globe on Maverick. Uh, he is also an accomplished musician, author, graduate of the Yale School of Divinity, and his book is currently available on Amazon and Kindle. So kindly welcome to the Saucer Yacht Club, Mr. Tony Johnson. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And it's an honor to be here at the Sausalito Yacht Club. Uh, well, not exactly at, but uh, virtually at the Yacht Club. And uh, thanks to Russ and uh, Carla for facilitating this. Um, I uh, am a circumnavigator. It's not anything to be ashamed of. And I, I brought this along with me uh, because I thought maybe some of you would have doubts about my bona fides. So this is an official certificate of navigation. And if you, if you look down at the bottom, it's signed by Merle Peterson, the president of the Pacific Ocean. So I think that should put all your doubts to rest. Uh, the, I don't know if anybody here knows Merle. Maybe we can talk afterwards, but um, uh, I'm not sure he's with us anymore. But anyway, that's about as official as you can get, uh, Merle. And then Andy Turpin from Latitude 38. Now, I, um, I'm not like many of you people. I'm not a, li a lifelong sailor. I came to sailing about 30 years ago. I was just an outdoors kind of a guy who liked, uh, you know, mountain biking, skiing, and so forth. And uh, I'd heard about San Francisco Bay being one of the great places to sail. And so I thought I'd sign up for some lessons. I went over to Tradewind Sailing Club and I got uh, assigned to an instructor named Ron Pook, who was a Kiwi, uh, not an actual bird, a, uh, a resident of um, New Zealand. And he was just the greatest. And what happened on that first day was really kind of amazing because Ron seemed to have, I'm sure all you have these abilities, but at the time it seemed really mysterious to me that he knew stuff and perceived things that I found invisible. Like he knew what the wind was doing, he knew what the boat was doing, he knew what the wind was likely to do. I mean, it was very strange. And, and the only thing I could do is, is like in one of those old Western movies when you have this guide who puts his ear to the ground and he says, there's four uh, horseback riders approaching. One is a teenage boy, and one is an old man with a scar on his left cheek. And he can tell all that just from listening to the ground. That's the kind of knowledge that Ron seemed to have. Uh, and I quickly, uh, you know, I started to read stuff. Back in those days, this is 30 years ago, believe it or not, it's like the Stone Age. There was no internet, there were no cell phones. I had to actually go buy books uh, to uh, figure out this stuff. But uh, it turns out there's a lot of literature about sailing. And in fact, our literature is, I like to think, uh, a cut above most of the literature. I'm sure they're great baseball writers, but they don't have Homer and Melville and Hemingway and London. Uh, we got those guys uh, in sailing. And I quickly, discovered it didn't take long to discover that sailing is such a rich thing that it was essentially infinite and everything about it fascinated me uh, all the boat stuff like uh, sail trim and race tactics uh, hull design uh, navigation everything about sailing the technical stuff the rig the marlin spike stuff all that really interested me and the history of it uh, was just amazingly rich. I mean, you have all the explorers. And also sailing has the oldest history, I think, perhaps of any human endeavor. And I say history kind of loosely because we don't know when it started. We, it, for a long time, it was thought the first navigators were the Australians. The Aborigines were in Australia and had to cross an ocean to get there. 65,000 years ago. That's, you know, tens of thousands of years before we uh, 
think that civilization, whatever that is, was developed in the Mideast. And that for a long time was thought the benchmark for the earliest navigators. And then about 10 years ago, there was discovered on the island of Crete of a sustained human habitation. And Crete has been an island for 5 million years. And there is a, a, a way to get there from the Peloponnesian Peninsula. It's about maybe 50 miles from the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And there's a couple of islands on the way. Um, and you could island hop, but even that ca uh, causes a, or would require a passage of 20 miles. So that was 130,000 years ago. And we don't have any evidence of Homo sapiens even being in Europe 130,000 years ago. So there is an off chance that that was Neanderthals uh, that made it over there. And then the most extreme uh, case is Homo floresiensis, the hobbit people, so-called hobbit people on the island of Flores, who uh, were not human. They were uh, their own species, really, of the genus Homo, and they uh, were more related to something like Homo erectus. And they uh, were probably on the island of Flores 800,000 years ago. Again, that's an island. You can't get there by uh, any means except going across an ocean. So all, anyway, all of this stuff just just kind of uh, absorbed me. And I uh, uh, delved into it, and still I'm delving into it. It's just great stuff. Now, as far as cruising goes, I think most people, when they think about voyaging across oceans, they think about stuff like this, like the picture on your screen, or this is, you know, a South Pacific Anchorage, or this is Bali, some exotic port like that, or here we are in uh, anchored in the Aegean, and you kind of have a vision like that of what cruising is going to be like. And people used to ask me the common question I would get is, "What was your favorite place to be, or where did you find the most fascinating?" And I used to say Bali because Bali really is excellent. Then I realized you can fly to Bali. Anybody can go to Bali. And so I changed it to the middle of the ocean because that's a really different place. It's very exotic. And you can't get there without paying the price. You have to go out there on your own little boat. Uh, you can be in the middle of the ocean on a, uh, a big cruise ship, but that's a, an entirely different thing. To be on a you know, 40, 50 foot boat in the middle of the ocean is a very exotic experience. So for a long time, that was my answer. But then I realized, really, this is uh, more like it here. You're seeing a picture of the horizon taken from Cape Flattery, which is on the coast of Washington. It's the westernmost point in the lower 48 states. So you go any further west, and you're in the water. And from here, that horizon, we can figure it out using a formula I'm sure you all know, it's the same formula you use for dipping a light. And uh, it's the height of I, the square root of the height of I times 1.17, and that'll give you about 12 miles. So from here, that horizon is about 12 miles away. 12 miles, uh, you can make 12 miles in say three hours in a boat, not even a very fast boat. And beyond that line, you're completely beyond the realm of civilization. You're in your own world. You can certainly contact somebody by radio for a while. If you have a long distance radio, you can do it forever. But uh, as far as your physical separation from civilization, you're gone. And I realized the most exciting and best times of the voyage for me were every time we picked up the anchor and headed out there to that line and we didn't know what was gonna happen. That was, those were the most exciting times. And the second most exciting time was every time you saw land after making a passage. Of course, um, that's kind of reassuring when you see that you're where you thought you were. Um, anyway, so we started our uh, circumnavigation on March 15th of 2001. It was actually the same day that um, the double-handed Farallon started, which we had participated in in uh, 
1999, the one where there was a fatality, it was a kind of mayhem filled day and we got dismasted that day. So two, two years later, we were heading out the gate. Uh, and this is our trip around the world. It's a, you know, your run of the mill circumnavigation. It's not one of those heroic ones like those guys in the Golden Globe just did or the Vendee Globe or anything like that. We never uh, thought of anything like setting records. It's not, wasn't our nature. So, uh, but we were happy enough to just be out there. We pretty much, the two different colored dots uh, uh, represent our planned trip and our actual trip. Here's the boat we were on, the, uh, the excellent Ericsson 39. There she is with a bone in her teeth. And uh, I'm not sure what race that it was. I, I think it might have been the Rites of Spring race. Um, and here's a sail plan. You can see the cutaway forefoot. And this at the time was a fairly radical design. It was a transitional design between the old full keel boats and the modern fin keel boats that uh, we're familiar with now. So and it was an avant-garde design at the time uh, by Bruce King. This is our storage plan. And I don't know why I put this in here, except that every book I ever read by, you know, the Hiscox and so forth, had a storage plan. So I thought I'd include my own storage plan in our book. So that's in the book. <clears throat> um, this is our spinnaker named Luigi. Uh, I could talk a long time about spinnakers. I, I think I wouldn't take one if I went again. They're fun to have up, but they're the conditions that you can use them in are limited, more limited than they are in the bay, because if the air is really light in the bay, you probably don't have uh, big seas, but you can have four foot, five foot seas in the ocean and still have very light winds, and so you can't keep your sail full. So anyway, we did love Luigi. Uh, uh, there is Terry Schroed. Now, uh, I took my lessons at Tradewinds, went through all the stuff and, and sailed a little bit too fanatically, I guess, and um, I ran out of people to go sailing with. I'm sure you've experienced that. You run, run out of crew. And I went up to the office and there was a lovely lady named La Natalie there. And she said, well, you got to meet Terry Schrode, uh, who was having the same problem. And here he is, uh, Mr. Schrode, now uh, of the title of the book. And we're trying to figure out how to install a monitor wind vane on the back of Maverick. Now, Terry was uh, uh, just the greatest guy in the world that I could have run into. I don't know uh, how things would have turned out. Well. I probably wouldn't have gone, which maybe that would have been a good thing. And he wouldn't have gone, which maybe would have been a good thing. But in any case, we were probably enablers for each other, just wanting uh, to do the next, you know, each one wanting to suggest something that was more radical than the last thing, last thing we'd done. And Terry and I were invited to help a man named Bob Miller deliver his new boat that he just bought in San Diego. Uh, and we flew down there uh, to help him bring the boat back up here. And it was this boat, Maverick. And there was something about that boat. Um, and I think Russ said that he uh, uh, was familiar with a boat called Black Pearl, which is a Sparkman and Stevens 38 uh, manufactured by Catalina. Anyway, this is a similar kind of boat from a similar era. Anyway, I saw Maverick down there, and that was her name then. I never have renamed the boat. And I saw, I, I don't know what it was, but I instantly realized this was a tatty boat. I mean, it was, the teak wasn't nice, the headliner was torn, the upholstery was torn. But for some reason, I instantly fell in love with that boat. I just could tell that the reason it was tatty was it had been loved to death, not because it had been neglected. Uh, people couldn't be bothered tending to uh, aesthetics. They wanted to go sailing. You could just tell that by, I could feel it from that boat. So anyway, we brought Maverick back. So between the boat and Terry, now I have, uh, and the skills I was learning at Tradewinds, I have all the pieces together. And the next thing was to suggest to Terry, let's sail around the world. And he normally is up for anything, but I think that's setting back just a little bit, just a notch, 
And he said, well, let me think about it, which means let me talk to my wife about it. And it turns out we both uh, are with women who couldn't possibly be more supportive and wonderful to this day, that's true. And so they said, yeah, go for it, boys. And I suppose that should have made us a little suspicious, but, uh, but in any case, they were uh, totally helpful through the whole uh, enterprise. And I always had to go up the mast because I'm the little guy. I wasn't going to crank Terry up there. This is Terry again and my wife, Teresa, uh, loading up the boat to get, uh, to get going. Uh, here is our cabin. For 27 months, we were gone. And uh, just one word about the cabin for you Voyager types. Uh, nowadays, if you look at a modern sailboat, like a big Veneto this size or something, it'll have a kind of uh, a saloon with wide open spaces, a big uh, dinette, and uh, you can practically run a, uh, a football game in there. And this is the old fashioned design, and there's a reason for it, which is it's one thing if you're going to do overnighters and weekenders and you're going to do a little coastal cruising to have a big saloon. But if you're going to go across an ocean, you really need to be able to sleep. And you can't sleep in the four peak or the beautiful aft cabin. You want to sleep as close to the uh, keel and mast as you can. That's where the motion is uh, most gentle. And so if any of you are in the market for getting a long distance cruising boat, I really strongly re uh, recommend you go with a traditional design like this for a lot of reasons, but just for the, uh, uh, for the soundness of sleep you get, it's very important from a safety standpoint. Uh, here we are leaving the Golden Gate. Now, we knew this was a risky business and I was willing to accept that. But when I, one thing I didn't wanna do was uh, if the ocean was going to kill me, I didn't want to do something stupid and help it out. And so the things I was worried about, here we are, this is the first day we're leaving. Things I was worried about is I'd, I'd made a mistake or I'd left something out. And as it turned out, we did two idiotic things right off the bat. And one of them was we left on the this date that we decided on, everybody knows you're not supposed to do that in sailing. You you wait for the weather. But it was really gnarly that day, and, and we went anyway, because people were waiting up here on um, Marin Headlands, uh, watch us sail off in the sunset, and we couldn't disappoint them. That was stupid. And then the other stupid thing was about, I would say, 30 seconds after, or maybe a minute after this picture was taken, we're motor sailing along, and all of a sudden we can't steer and it's because our autopilot has jammed itself. And that meant we couldn't, and, and we couldn't disengage it. So here we are in the shipping lane, it's blown 2025 and we can't steer the boat. So we had to disassemble things real quick and put them back together. And any sane person would have said, okay, we gotta go get this fixed and this is stupid. But you know, Terry and I didn't even consider it. We had a monitor vein and we said, uh, we're just, we're not turning around. We couldn't bear it. So right off the bat within um, <laughs> the first 24 hours, we did stupid stuff. Um, this is obviously a picture of the world. Uh, it's a Google Earth image from about 22,000 miles up. And I have this there to show you, this is a picture of the, of the same altitude looking at the Pacific Ocean. And that's how big the Pacific Ocean is. If you were in space and approaching our planet, uh, of course, there's no clouds because it's a Google Earth image, but you just would hardly see any land. That's how big the Pacific Ocean is. Uh, this is a computer generated uh, picture of the winds from approximately the time we left. So what you have here is, this is some familiar stuff. Here's the Northeast trades, the Southeast trades, is Pacific high and here are lows in the southern hemisphere that are rotating clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise and then this line here is the inner uh, uh, the ITCZ intertropical convergence zone and uh, otherwise known as the doldrums and here's a satellite image of the same 
area. And you can see the clouds there generated by the uh, convection over the ITCZ. The ITCZ is always about five degrees or more above the equator. It's not right on the equator. So 27 days after our departure from San Francisco, we took the direct route to the Marquesas. A lot of people, when they go sailing uh, to the South Pacific, go to Mexico first. But we decided that was uh, chicken. We were just going to go for it. We didn't want to, no, <laughs> no half measures. We wanted to go directly. Uh, we didn't want to get stuck in Mexico. As Terry said, just like Admiral Nelson says, damn the maneuvers just go straight at them so we went to uh this is Hiva oa in the marquesas and this is our land first landfall after 27 days and the natives were kind enough to lay out a rainbow for us uh this is our first very first anchorage and it was a tropical paradise just like you would fantasize about just beautiful very small little village and a bunch of other cruisers this is uh, a nearby, another of the Marquesas. This is Wapo. And now we've traveled on to, we've sailed on to Tahiti. This is an anchorage called Kafa'a, which is kind of around the corner from Papayete. And being from the Bay Area, uh, we're not familiar with anchorages more than about, uh, I don't know, 20 feet. Uh, here we're anchored in about 60, 65 feet. And what, what the situation is, I don't know how many of you have sailed down there, but you have a lagoon that's uh, a fringing reef around the island of Tahiti. And so you see that sailboat out there and about, I don't know, maybe 100 yards further or maybe a little more, two or 300 yards, there's a reef, it's underwater. But what it does is protects you from the surge so that it takes the energy out of the surge that's approaching the land. Um, it didn't, it wasn't enough to protect us a little, while we were there, uh, our wives had come down to visit us and on Maverick, I was at anchor with Teresa. Terry had gone ashore with his wife and a gale blow through, blew through and it was uh, blown about 40 but it was from the opposite direction of the trades. So it swung us around on our anchor and put us on the reef. And we hadn't gotten very far. You know, we'd only gotten to Tahiti. And in my mind, this was it. You know, this is as far, we're idiots. And this is as far as we're gonna make it to Tahiti, what fools. But somehow, Teresa, who's not a sailor, and I managed to get the boat off the reef. It was horrific. The noises and the grinding against the reef were uh, terrifying, horrifying. But uh, we got off, and there was a, still a gale blowing. The anchor didn't drag, by the way. We had swung onto it because I failed to properly, you know, you, if you're in 60 feet and you have four to one out or something like that, uh, I put out some extra road because there was a gale coming in. So we probably had 250 feet out and you're trying to gauge the circumference or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, diameter of that circle for swinging room. And it's not that easy to eyeball. And I just barely got us on the reef, but it was enough to create a lot of horror. Anyway, we got out of there. Uh, and this, what you're looking at is a sunset over Morea. Uh, Morea is uh, the next island across from Tahiti, and that's where we sailed to next. This is Morea. This is Opanohu Bay on Morea, and that spire there in the middle is uh, uh, was in the movie South Pacific and was called Bali High, and Terry would just not stop singing Bali High from the movie South Pacific while we were there. All Every five minutes, I'm exaggerating, but every five minutes, Terry was singing, Bali Hai. And so <laughs> we, had, we had to endure that. Uh, beautiful though. Uh, it's not, Cook's Bay is next door, but Cook's Bay is where all the cruise ships go. But you get to go here because you have a sailboat. This is uh, Bora Bora. About a quarter mile to your right is all those people in the resorts paying $1,000 a night for those uh, rooms on stilts, but we were paying nothing. Now, this is something that you don't hear about much. Uh, the South Pacific Convergence Zone, 
the ITCZ, you see that there. This is the South Pacific, there's Australia. And the South Pacific Convergence Zone sometimes is stronger than other times. And our year was a very strong year. And what it creates is this alley that, the like a bowling alley that these lows just come plunging down uh, along that track, the South Pacific Convergence Zone. And unfortunately, they were right in front of us all the time. And we got, we got hit by quite a few gales. So our passage across the South Pacific wasn't quite as um, mellow as you may have read in the brochures about lovely uh, trade winds sailing. Anyway, I'm not whining. It, it was still great. Uh, this is in Tonga, and I, I like this picture because it demonstrates that pretty much everywhere we went, we were welcomed with open arms and friendliness and smiles. This is, uh, people didn't hate Americans, or they may hate America, but they didn't hate us, and they didn't hate the people of America. They were always kind and friendly, and these guys had just made something called brown wine, which was in that bucket, and they wouldn't tell us what it was, but uh, you can see that a mood of general conviviality was the result. Uh, and then these guys are serving us kava, another inebriating uh, beverage. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but uh, we were welcomed with open arms to Savu Savu in Fiji. And uh, with these two guys here, I, I, I stayed around to drain um, the kava. Uh, and I think Terry did too. And they, you're supposed to not only drink kava, you're also supposed to drink beer. So we're drinking kava and beer and uh, got pretty toasty. Uh, we did these kiwis here. They, they think they're so tough, man. They toddled off after a couple of drinks. They were just tourists. Uh, dancing girls, they, uh, Sabu Sabu people brought out the dancing girls. It was just a wonderful, wonderful party. A lovo, I can't, I think they call it. It's like a luau, except it's the Fijian term instead of the Hawaiian one. Now, around the corner, an, another island in the Fiji group is Malolo Lailai, which is where the famous Musket Cove Yacht Club is. And we had, we were anchored there at about 60 feet. And it's another situation where you have a reef to windward. So there's a reef out here someplace, you can't see it. And uh, what happens in these situations is when the tide rises, let's say the reef is three feet under the surface of the water. Well, when the tide rises, it might be six feet under the surface. And that makes a lot of difference in how much protection it affords you. We had received a, uh, a weather uh, forecast saying there was a gale coming in with winds from the north. So, Malolo Lila is protected from the north. We said, well, we'll stick here, this is safe. But the wind came from the south. And so for a couple of days, it blew 40 through our anchorage. And since the tide would go up and down, when the, high, when the tide was high, uh, we were getting very little protection. As you know from taking pictures at sea, you can't really represent how big the seas are. But this was a pretty uh, uh, violent chop that we were experiencing for a couple of days. In these situations, we always, kept an anchor watch. So there was somebody always awake for a couple of days there, 48 hours. And we never dragged, but uh, we were lucky. These guys did, and uh, they went on the reef and uh, their boat was holed. Uh, moving on to Vanuatu, we're now in Vanuatu. Uh, I just took happened to take a picture of this boat because I thought it was so beautiful. And uh, it was at the harbor there in Vanuatu, in the Afu, and uh, no, that was Tonga. Uh, anyway, in, in Vanuatu, and we found out later it sank in the Java Sea. It's a beautiful thing to go missing. All right, so from over here is where we were, and we sail across to Nui, Fiji, Vanuatu, Tonga, and when we got about right here in the Coral Sea, Coral Sea was nice to us. It's supposed to be rough, but it was nice to us. We got an email from Caroline, Terry's wife, saying that 9-11 had occurred and the Twin Towers had been attacked. Well, 
that was really surreal news. We're not anywhere near America. We're out in the middle of the ocean. And we managed to dial up the BBC and listen to the radio. Uh, it was the it was kind of like hearing uh, or seeing one of those films from World War II where people are listening around the radio to what's going on. That's what we did for a couple of days until we got into Port Moresby. And there we could, um, the yacht club there just was very warm and welcoming and they allowed us to take over the TV so we could see all the news from back in the States. And it was just unbelievable. It was, it was uh, shocking. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. So the problem was that at this point, we headed out to Australia and we began to hear rumors that Americans were being attacked by Muslims in the Muslim world, in the Arab world. Uh, Americans were being beaten and attacked. We, we started to hear rumors over the radio like this. And so we were um, just about to head, after Australia, we were just about to head into the Muslim world. I mean, the whole thing after Australia is Indonesia, one of the biggest Muslim, or the biggest Muslim world, a uh, Muslim country in the world. And then um, up through the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean and then Oman and the Red Sea and Saudi Arabia, Egypt and so forth. So we had to decide what we were gonna do. Uh, this is the way into uh, Australia. This is the Torres Strait, the famed Torres Strait. You enter up here and you have to go through all these, it's like a pinball machine and you sp get spit out down here by, um, Prince of Wales, the Prince of Wales uh, Channel, and the Prince of Wales Channel, there, this is between two oceans, so there's a tremendous amount of current running through there. It could be nine knots, so you don't want to hit adverse current, and so it was very important to navigate your way through there to arrive at a benign tidal flow, and I managed, but I think I, I said this in the book, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think Terry thought it was unsporting of me to try to figure the whole thing out ahead of time. But I charted this whole thing out depending on wind conditions and currents and so forth. And I, 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 I'm proud to say I nailed it. We made it into the Prince of Wales Channel about 10 minutes before west blowing tide uh, right at, at, at Slack and made it through no problem. The whole thing was a pleasure cruise. Uh, now, so we're down here in Darwin and we have to make a decision about whether to proceed into the Muslim world with all these dire stories we're getting. And Terry and I talked about it and we were getting some input from back home and also our insurance company said they wouldn't cover us for anything between Darwin and um, the, Red, uh, the Mediterranean. But we, Terry and I talked to each other and we just found it unbelievable that all the people in the Muslim world would all of a sudden become homicidal, homicidal maniacs overnight and start killing other people. Most people are just not like that. They, they go to work, they go home to their families and they live normal lives. Most people are not terrorists and horrible people. And we just decided we would just continue on with what we had planned to the Muslim world. And not only that, we decided to fly the American flag, not because we're gung-ho America number one kind of guys, but because that's nautical tradition. That's what you do. You fly the flag of your home port um, when uh, you're at sea. And so we did that through the entire Muslim world and got not one word of negativity from any, anybody in the Muslim world. Nobody said boo to us. Anyway, we, we uh, left Darwin. We sailed uh, up to Bali and got a lot of uh, very exotic dance uh, shows. It was an excellent place, Bali. This is a thunderstorm uh, viewed from a satellite, and that's what they look like, a tabletop there, anvil top. And this is what they look like in the Pacific. This is a squall that has just passed us through the Pacific, and maybe it blew 30 or something like that. Uh, but in the Java Sea, they have the strongest and most frequent thunderstorms in the world. So this is what they look like. Uh, and we were going upwind in the Java Sea for a thousand miles. We had a uh, pretty rough passage uh, from Bali to uh, Borneo and then Borneo to uh, Singapore or actually across from Singapore uh, or at Knox Point. Anyway, 
the whole time we're upwind and then every once in a while you get hit with one of these guys and and you'd see this black cloud in about 10 minutes you'd be hit with 65 knot winds the uh uh it was hurricane force and the good news was <laughs> the good news was that they only lasted for about a half hour 45 minutes so the seas couldn't get up very big uh, in that space of time but you did have that amount of wind to deal with so you'd put a triple reef in the main and roll up most of the jib and bear off a little and maverick was able to handle that pretty well after a few times and a few changes of underwear we, we managed to get this uh uh under control and i i'd say we had half a dozen of these maybe terry could correct me but we we had a few of these um uh on our way up the uh, Java Sea. But then we'd be scared and then we'd see these guys. Uh, these are local fishermen in their open boat. No PFDs, no radio, no EPIRB, no any kind of uh, safety gear. They didn't have anything. They were just out in their boat smiling away like nothing ever happened. They were out in the same weather, just as far away from shore as we were. So, eh, I don't know, that was humbling. Uh, when we got to Borneo, we were in the middle of Ramadan, and they were playing uh, all night from dusk to dawn. They played the Quran. People uh, were chanting the prayers from the Quran uh, all night uh, over loudspeakers. And we went into town, and uh, we stopped in this little store, and this very pleasant little lady here was running the store, and she asked us where we were from, and we said, America. And she said, well, are you Christians? And I had come to understand that this is really a tribal question. It's not a theological question. And so uh, I said, yes. Um, and so in other words, are you Muslims? No, we're not. We're Christians. And so um, she said, well, uh, are we enemies then? And I said, uh, I don't feel like I'm your enemy. You don't seem like scary to me uh no i don't think we're enemies and she said are you afraid and i said well no i actually don't feel afraid should i feel afraid and she smiled very sweetly and said yes uh but these guys were right around the corner and they didn't look very scary uh they're playing dominoes and the objective uh when you win you get to put clothes pins on the other guy's face so the reward of your victory is to see the other guy in pain. Um, this is a guy named Gilong. Now we came to Borneo, one of the objective, objectives was to see uh, one of the two places in the wild where you can visit orangutans. And this was our guide, a guy named Gilong. Again, not a scary guy. Very interesting guy, knew a lot about a lot of stuff beyond uh, orangutans. Anyway, he took us up the river and we were able to see, this is a, a dominant male uh, in the forest there at Tangent Pudding Park. That's, I think, for most people, a thrill of a lifetime. Uh, so that was pretty wonderful. And the jungle was very wonderful. This, this place is being torn to bits by both legal and illegal logging. Uh, for palm plantations, so don't buy palm oil. Don't buy anything with palm oil in it. Would be, uh, if I can put that little bit in there. Uh, this is Phuket. Now we, from Bali, we went up to Singapore and then up, up the Strait of Malacca to Phuket. And this is a long tail, which is a traditional local uh, craft. Uh, Maverick was able to anchor in here. Uh, we could go up to Panga Bay. Now they take a lot of tourists. To, uh, uh, excursions out there but after the tourists leave I mean we had this all to ourselves it's one of the most beautiful uh, bays you'll ever see and it's what they use to film the James Bond films a couple of them and but as you can see there was nobody there except us uh, all right from uh, Phuket we headed, headed across the Bay of Bengal to Sri Lanka and I have a little P and an exclamation point and an arrow to remind me to tell the story that happened there. Uh, all through this trip, as you probably are aware, people are uh, terrified of pirates. Now, uh, the pirate um, 
website that I visit, pirate website, the information on piracy that I was able to obtain before we left uh, Australia said that in the Java and South China Seas where we were headed, there were 500 pirate attacks the previous year. But we hadn't seen anything. And then we went across the Bay of Bengal and we were motoring into Colombo as dead calm and this boat came up beside us. Now it's not that strange for a fishing boat, let's say about a 30 foot fishing boat with maybe eight guys, six, eight guys in it to pull up beside your boat and want to sell you fish or lobsters. But these guys were very aggressive. They didn't have the same friendly demeanor we were used to seeing. And so uh, I was just speechless. I didn't know what to say. I knew they, they wanted to get on board and, and do, I mean, fishermen will do this. They're not professional pirates, but they have been known to take advantage. You, you don't have, there's no cops out there. There's nobody call. So you're helpless out there. And they have been known uh, to be uh, kind of opportunistic and take advantage of lone cruisers out there. And they see an American boat and they go, oh boy. So anyway, they wanted to get on board. And I, this all came, became apparent within about two seconds. And I didn't know what to do. Terry was down in the cabin and all of a sudden Terry comes out of the cabin and he, he, turns, he turns himself into the sweetest, most simple-minded um, simple human being you can imagine uh, beyond Forrest Gump. He was just this sweet, innocent guy. And he started to ask them what they were doing. Were they fishermen? Was it fun to be a fisherman? And he wanted to know if he could get on their boat. Did they have any fish? Could he see any of their stuff? And he was just asking all these questions. Now, you wouldn't really think that an adult human being could pull this off, but Terry did pull it off. You know, do you have candy? And he was so sweet and so apparently unaffected and uh, simple. They just stared at him. And after a while, you could see their mood soft. And they couldn't, they couldn't proceed with this. They, they just said, we can't hurt this guy. And they left. Unbelievable. That's our pirate story. And there's no doubt in my mind that they intended a harm to us. There's just zero doubt. They, they were not the friendly uh, fishermen we usually see. Now, one of the things I noted I didn't mention at the beginning was only about, well, if you look on Latitude 38's list of circumnavigators, you'll see a list of fewer than 400 boats from the West Coast. And that's about, there are only about maybe 50 more boats than there were when we went around. So people have not been going on circumnavigations recently. And that number, it just is remarkably small. If you think about it, if you double that number for the East Coast, because those are West Coast guys, and then you add 50%, which I don't think is really necessary, because Latitude is pretty careful about this. But if you add 50% for boats we may have missed. That's 1,200 boats, which means about 2,500 people, Americans, have sailed around the world forever. I mean, this is counting since the beginning of the last century. Uh, 2,500 people is, is the number of people that have played in the um, World Series or have won Academy Awards. It's not a very large number of people. It's kind of amazing, actually. Uh, it's slightly, it's more than the people that have climbed Everest, the Americans, but it's still a very small number of people. And I wonder why it's so small. I think it's probably very likely that the reason is people are afraid of the pirates with good reason. I'm not saying they shouldn't be. But otherwise, the difference between sailing around the world and getting an Academy Award or playing in the World Series is that sailing around the world doesn't take any talent. It's just, you know, I'm going to sail around the world. So uh, it's kind of peculiar the numbers are so slow. I wish people would get out there. It really um, isn't uh, uh, an insurmountable uh, goal for sure. Anyway, from there we went to Oman. Oman is a friendly Arab country. And uh, on the way there, we stopped at Ulogan. This is in the Maldives. Uh, it's one of the northernmost islands in the Maldives. And when we were there, we were at Anchorage, uh, this Anchorage off of Ulagan. 
And one of the very coolest things about this anchorage is that everybody, every boat in this picture is a circumnavigator. And this is where we started to form very strong bonds with the people that we were sailing with. We got to know these people here for the first time because all of the stops we've been on before had local cruisers and maybe charters or uh, uh, regional sailors. But these guys, you don't get to Uligan unless you're going around the world. So we were all about to head to the Red Sea. So we're all a little tentative and uh, but still some very wonderful, bold people that we kept in touch with many of them until we returned to the United States. Uh, this is Oman, little camel crossing there. And this is also Oman. This is not a Hollywood set. These guys were dressed like this. Um, this is Salala, Oman, where, the, um, uh, where we met. That's the harbor we were at. It's the same harbor that if you've seen the movie, um, uh, Captain Phillips. He starts out from Salala, Oman. That's the place we were uh, before his fated voyage. And we were about to head into the Gulf of Aden, which is the most uh, feared of the pirate zones, although others have sprung up since then. And my wishes were, I had said this for months, that what I wanted when we got to the Gulf of Aden was 30 knots and 15 foot seas, because then I knew you can't get on a 30 foot boat from a 30 foot boat in a 15 foot sea. You're gonna, it's suicidal. So that was my plan for our protection. Another uh, thing that we did though, is we joined forces with, this is typical at Oman, you group up with a few other boats, maybe five, six other boats, and you try to form a convoy. I don't know what good that does, uh, really, but we did that, and I think some of the convoys are more dangerous to each other than they are to the pirates, but in any case, uh, we traveled down here through, uh, kind of in the middle of the Gulf of Aden, up through the Bab el Mandeb, which is the Gate of Tears uh, in Arabic, and up into the Red Sea, and nobody was attacked that year by pirates. It was the first year in 20 years that no cruiser had been uh, boarded by pirates. So from there we went up to Eritrea, which is in this neighborhood, and then we sailed up the Red Sea. We were having engine troubles. Uh, there was a knock in the engine, and we weren't, to go into port, you had to really use your engine. We didn't want to do that, so we, it's not recommended, but we sailed straight up the Red Sea, and we didn't have too much trouble until we got up to the top by Hergata. And I was in the cabin doing some navigation and Perry was driving and he said to me, you know, uh, it's getting really hard to see out here. It's, it's uh, dusty. And I stuck my head out and it was blowing 25 and we were in the middle of a dust storm in uh, the Red Sea, which is not unknown. And so here we were in a bunch of coral reefs. It was blowing 25 on the nose and we were having an attack through coral reefs. Now, we couldn't see anything, so we couldn't use visual navigation. So we had the GPS and we had a, a, a sea map, which was, <coughs> pardon me, a computer charting program. And I was doing a navigation down there on a chart, on a paper chart, as well as the computer. And uh, we were having a great time for some reason. I don't know why, but... Uh, we probably wouldn't have had a great time if we hit something. But anyway, <clears throat> we managed to make it uh, to an anchorage and our picture was snapped by some uh, friends of ours on a, a very good Dutch couple, uh, snapped our picture when we made it to the top of the Red Sea. You can see all the dirt on the hull. That's oil from Eritrea and there's sand all over the boat and salt in all the lines. Uh, but we were there and we felt okay. Did some sightseeing in Egypt. That's the Nile. Here's the Valley of the Kings. Now, from there you head up the Gulf of Suez. This is the Gulf of Aqaba and the Sinai Peninsula. <clears throat> and then you're heading for the Suez Canal. On the way up there, we ran into a gale. Uh, it was blowing about 35 on the nose and it was predicted to go to 45, so we had to seek shelter. Now, 
when you go up the Red Sea, that's one of the most dangerous things that happens. That's how boats are lost, that you get caught in one of these gales, you try to look for shelter behind uh, uh, in some bay or behind some island, and you don't have really good charts for that area. I mean, no matter what, we had paper charts, computer charts, and we were entering, I don't, I'm not sure this is actually it. See, this is a picture from uh, a satellite. Not really. Anyway, uh, that we entered a, a little bay like this, and uh, oh, we had paper charts and a computer chart, and uh, there was a coral reef surrounding us like a U or U shaped bay or with a little entrance, and you couldn't see the coral pass through the entrance, the pass through the coral. And there were two range marks on land two sets of range marks, and they didn't agree with one another. So that was our information to get in there. Um, uh, a bad chart, a uh, two small scale paper chart, and two contradictory range marks. So I, we were with buddy boating with another guy and he said, you first. So I drove through there with my heart in my throat and we made it. I'm not really, that's just, uh, there but for fortune i just was lucky and uh the wind came through and did blow about 45 they closed the suez canal so we were lucky to get in there but that year about 100 boats 100 cruise cruising boats went up the red sea and five of them were lost in just this kind of situation so that's one out of 20 boats you don't have that's not really good odds honestly so here is the Suez Canal, it's a sea level canal, and you're in there with the big boys. And it's a two day trip, you go up to Ismailia, which is about halfway, you change pilots, they have put a pilot on board. And then this is up to Port Said on the second day. And that was, that had its own excitements, I won't go into that, but we made it through there unscathed somehow barely and uh, well not quite unscathed and we were through the muslim world the feared muslim world without one unkind word to us said by any uh muslim the whole time uh that's port said in the rearview mirror there uh from there we went to turkey and then the aegean this is simi in the uh greek islands uh again this is another port in simi this is a typically beautiful quaint uh greek island we we went to a lot of the greek islands this one is closer to turkey than mainland greece this is a picture taken from uh, mount synthes which is uh a mountain on the sacred island of delos and it's the mountain uh where apollo and his sister artemis were born uh this is a picture of a um remake of uh odysseus is a bronze age boat that of the type that odysseus may have sailed and now we're in his wine dark seas from uh across the aegean we went through the uh uh Saronic Gulf to the Gulf of Corinth through the Corinth Canal, and then we visited a Galaxity. I thought that was a great name, and and uh, got a berth there, and then went up to uh, uh, Delphi. This is a uh, Terry driving in the Corinth Canal. Looks happy, uh, and this is the Oracle at Delphi or the ruins thereof. We asked the Oracle if we were going to make it home okay, and. Uh, as usual, the oracle was non-committal. Here is the island of Ithaca. This is uh, Odysseus's kingdom. And this is the rock of Gibraltar from our birth at Gibraltar. When we approached Gibraltar, it was pea, thick, a pea soup fog. We couldn't see anything. So luckily, we, the next day we saw it. This is the Bay of Gibraltar. And then this is the uh, Strait of Gibraltar, and Gibraltar itself is only this tiny little point. That is Gibraltar. Uh, it's the flow in this strait is net always into the Mediterranean because the rivers, even the Nile, 
that flow into the Mediterranean are not enough to keep up with evaporation. So the Atlantic is constantly filling up the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, so it's a little bit of a navigational puzzle to get out of their safety. We had to leave in the middle of the night. This is looking back at Gibraltar at about at dawn, you know, just the rosy fingers of dawn. We probably left at about 2 a.m. and uh, made it out of there fairly safety, safely, went down the coast to, this is Morocco. And then across to, this is Graciosa in the Canary Islands. And then we went to La Gomera. Now, La Gomera is the island from which uh, Christopher Columbus set out to uh, cross the Atlantic and discover what he thought was India, but it was actually the Car uh, Caribbean San Salvador. Uh, and this is a replica of the Nina, one of his ships. Now, we had a similar problem to uh, Columbus because we had discovered that a uh, flange connecting our prop shaft had gone bad or it was improperly installed in Greece. Something happened, I don't know. And we needed a machine shop and there was no machine shops on La Gomera. So it meant returning uh, to some place where we could get some machine work done. And I just said, you know, Columbus crossed the Atlantic without an engine. I think we can do it. So this was another one of those dumb decisions uh, that we uh, made on the trip. I mean, you're either part of the audience or you're part of the show, the way I look at it. So we were part of the show. We headed out from La Gomera with no ability to motor. We, we could use our uh, engine to charge batteries. That was it. We couldn't uh, use it to motor. So what we did was we waited till a gale was blowing out of the north that would get us to the trades because the distance between the Canaries and the trades is substantial. I can't remember. I think it's about six, uh, 600 miles, but it's a long ways. And it tends to not have any wind. And since we didn't have an engine, we decided to wait for a gale to blow us down to the, the uh, trades. So right out of uh, the Canaries, this is what we were seeing, 20 foot seas and about, it was like 35 to 45 knots for about three or four days. <clears throat> um, but it was okay. Uh, it was just kind of, some Englishman passed us and said he was miserable, and I was so pleased to hear that. Uh, because <laughs> we weren't really miserable, and there, the British are always lording it, lording it over us. The Kiwis, the British, are always uh, talking about how tough they are, or, or proposing as tough sailors. So I love to see him whine. Okay, so we got about thirty miles from Karaku, which was our destination. And it's, of course, it's three o'clock in the morning and Terry wakes me up. It was his watch. And he says, uh, Tony, I'll, I'll look at this. This is interesting. Uh, and the last thing you ever wanted to hear Terry say was something was interesting. It immediately made my blood run cold. And he said, there's a lot of water in the bilge. So we immediately, I mean, within seconds, we had looked at all the through hulls and the um, uh, the packing gland and the gland on the rudder post, and nothing was wrong with anything, which was not good news. We had to start then tearing up hatches and looking under the floorboards and seeing what was going on. And I discovered uh, a half a dozen fountains about pencil lead width spraying water up into the cabin through the hull. So this was coming directly through the hull. That much we knew. We didn't know where it was coming from because um, Maverick had an encapsulated keel. It didn't have a bolt-on keel. And so it could have been migrating up there from any place in the keel. So it wasn't immediately clear where it was coming from. But we... Uh, <laughs> We started to get on the radio and, and ask for um, uh, help, ask for assistance. I think we may have put out, uh, out a mayday. I don't know. We did not put out a mayday, but we started to see if we could raise anybody. And finally, about 7 o'clock in the morning, we raised somebody on a uh, 
I don't know if it was seven, it's probably like five, five thirty, on a cruising boat. It was anchored off the island, and he he responded to us and was able to reach the um, uh, boatyard at Karaku. Uh, eventually, he couldn't reach him right away and tell him what was going on. And those guys uh, told us <laughs> later. Later, they told us that. Uh, Everybody on the island was listening to our, our because everybody had VHFs and they were all had Channel 16. Hey, check out Channel 16. This guy's sinking. He might die, you know. So everybody was tuning in to 16 and listening to us. And he claimed, I mean, the guys there, Jerry was the guy who ran a, um, a tug service and a, a, was partners in a boatyard. Jerry said he claimed that my voice was getting higher and higher as I was talking on 16. I don't believe this. I deny that. But anyway, uh, what they did eventually, you know, to make matters worse, when you get into Karakou, we're sailing and you had to head up and sail through a bunch of reefs to get into Chiral Bay where the boatyard was. So we're on the radio to these guys and they say, we got you covered. We got the travel lift out. We'll be waiting for you. But still, we had to get there. And Terry, uh, so I'm dealing with this. Terry is actually down dealing with this leak. And he's got a bunch of rags and, and clay and pieces of lumber. And he's got things jammed in there to try to stem the flow. And we're running a bilge pump. And we were keeping track of how much water was coming up to the bilge and how fast it was coming up. And it was getting faster. And uh, so, Things are a little tense. I don't think we lost it though. We were just doing what you got to do. And so we turned the corner into Turtle Bay. Well, what we didn't know was there was a crack in the hull, which I'll show you in a middle, minute. So as soon as we sheeted in, that crack opened up and water started pouring in the hull. And we knew we could run the engine for about, you know, for five minutes anyway, without the thing blowing up. So at that point, we started the engine and we, had not had time to really navigate our way in there. We were too busy. So Jerry was on the radio saying, turn right, turn left, you know, uh, okay, that's far enough, turn right. <laughs> and trying to get us uh, conned into the travel lift. And we finally got in there and they picked us up and, and uh, they pulled us up in a travel lift and we saw this crack and water was just pouring out of this crack in the hull. This is a crack that's right in front of the keel uh, right under the main bulkhead. And it's a thwart ships. It's about 18 inches long on each side of the hull. So what was happening was the hull was breaking in half. The boat was breaking in half. And I've, you know, all boats are trying to break in half right here. I mean, what you got is the forestay and backstay pulling up and the mast of the keel pushing down. So the rig is trying to tear the boat apart anyway, but usually that doesn't happen. And one of the other things is when it does happen, the boat just sinks. And one of the famous instances of this was Australia 1, I think, or Australia 2 off of San Diego. They had to lead, lead a sheet to a winch that they hadn't designed uh, or engineered to hold the uh, force of it. So they sheet in and cracked the hull in half. And it went down in like a, I mean, it went down in like a minute. It was gone. But we didn't sink, uh, luckily. But I don't think we could have held out another hour. I, we made it in there by the skin of our teeth. There's no, there's no, uh, no question about that. Now we weren't a hundred percent out of ideas. Uh, we could have put a sail under the hull. We didn't really know what was going on because all we knew is that water was coming in. But we, there's a lot of other things we could do. Plus, we had a life raft. We didn't think we were going to die. Uh, but we could lose the boat. That was a real possibility. We really thought it was not unlikely we'd lose the boat right then and there. Anyway, uh, we made it in. They took care of us really well at the boat yard. We ended up staying in this shack here for, we had to move out of the boat. And luckily there were guys there that we learned to have faith in. Well, you know, the sailing community isn't that big. And we had a lot of email friends that were like, um, not only uh, uh, boat rights, but we knew uh, a couple of naval architects and we knew friends of friends. And, you know, seven degrees of, or like three or four degrees of separation, 
people knew these guys who were at the boatyard. There was an engineer and a glass guy. And this kind of repair, as you probably know, is not often seen on American boats, nor are they uh, Caribbean boats. And so that means nobody ever fixes it. So here you are in a foreign country, trusting people you've met before, uh, never met before to fix something that they've never fixed before. And your life depends on it. <laughs> so uh, it was an act of faith. When we left Karakou, um, I don't want to get too uh, serious here, but it was the one time in the whole voyage that I felt, if, if I may say so, the weight of command, because this was my decision and my decision alone. There was nobody, there was no institution, no uh, inspection body or anything that would tell me it was safe. It was my decision to trust these guys and think we could go to sea. So, and Terry's life is in my hands. Not only uh, uh, the boat and my own life, but Terry's life. And this is something as a skipper uh, weighs heavily on you. If, you've ever been, if you've been a skipper, you know that. If you've been a decent skipper, you know that. Anyway, so I decided it was okay to go and it turned out okay and we made it back to California. But uh, believe me, when I could dive under the boat and take a look at that hull, I was doing it and I was always checking the rig. And uh, uh, But we had to sail right into the uh, Western Caribbean and the Western Caribbean is extremely ro rough with square waves and we had 30 to 35 knots, some other fellow cruisers lost a bunch of gear um, in the same conditions. It blew up to 50 around Aruba, or is it Aruba? Anyway, one of them islands, it blew around about 50. And we were there with this boat that had had its back broken. So the skipper was a little bit nervous, but anyway, uh, a faint heart never won a fair lady. This is Maverick anchored in the San Blas Islands. We made it across the Western uh, Caribbean. And this is how they sail down. That's a trapeze there, uh, San Blas Island style. Very wonderful people. We met a guy named Juan who take, took us every place, charges nothing. Uh, was a wonderful tour guide, spoke Spanish, and the native, he was a native uh, Kuna Indian. They're Kunas, they're not San Blas Islanders. Uh, and their land is called Kunda Yala. Anyway, enough of that. They were, that was a wonderful stay. This is some of the kids there. You can see they were really obnoxious. We didn't like them at all. Um, uh, Juan was nice enough to write, this is written out in the native, native language. We, we had a printer aboard and we printed this up and we distributed it to some of the people who were helpful to us. And basically it says, thanks very much from the crew of Maverick to the people of Kundiyala. Uh, and uh, this is the Panama Canal. And this, I like this picture just because it shows how tight they cut it this technology that they use to get these boats. Now they have a new uh, uh, canal now. They've dug a wider, deeper canal, but this uh, was 20 years ago and they had, this is the same technology that was uh, put into service in 1914 and was still working. They don't do anything different and there's no computers. They do it all by eye and they get these ships through there. It's crazy. Um, and this is our last view of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the, those are the gates closing on the Atlantic, putting us up onto Gatton Lake, and this is inside the locks. Um, Maverick's in the middle there. They tie, this is pretty funny, they take the boat with the biggest engine, which was us, and they tied boats on either side of you. And I'm not sure if you've had, ever had an experience on your boat of tying two other boats beside you and then driving around, but it's a bit unwieldy and it's a bit scary because there are cement walls not too far away. And if you screw up, somebody else's boat is going to get smashed. Now that's the good news is because it won't be your boat. It'll be somebody else's boat. But uh, that was dicey. Now this picture here is taken at the Miraflores lock. This is on the Pacific side. And this is a webcam picture taken from the United States. When we got to the Miraflores locks, we emailed, we, we knew what our, the time of our passage was and our pilot, you have to have a pilot there and in the Suez Canal. Our pilot called the cameraman and said, uh, make sure you get Maverick on the webcam. And so we emailed everybody back home and told them to look up the 
Miraflores webcam. And so this is taken from back home. And uh, there you go, 3-13-2003 uh, uh, at 1540 52. That might even be Pacific time. I don't know, 340. Uh, probably not. Uh, anyway, so that's Terry up on right here on the Ratlands taking a picture of the camera that's taking a picture of uh, us. So this is kind of scary. This is what it looks like when you're going on the downside and like you got this 60 foot drop or whatever it is right in front of you, uh, hoping that that gate holds. And that's the bridge of the Americas leading to the Pacific Ocean. And now we're back in our home waters. And the trip back from there was kind of boring. Uh, well, I don't know, boring. Nothing was boring. There was never a day that was boring for 27 months. But here we are back home. And there we are back in our home marina and with some flags of the countries we visited. And there you go. There are your boys. That's ussmaverick.net. There are more pictures and stories there if you haven't heard enough blabbing now. And this is the book, The Captain and Mr. Schrode. It's available in print and Kindle on Amazon. Uh, and I'm sure any bookstore could order it for you um, if bookstores are available in your neighborhood anymore. So there you go, folks. Uh, that is it. And uh, I guess we'll open it up, Russ, for questions or any discussions or whatever you want to do. That's absolutely terrific, Captain Tony. That was awesome. Hey, we do have a lot of questions, and uh, we'll go to them sort of in order. And the first one coming from Commodore Tom. Go ahead and ask your questions. You're off mute. Well, my, my, my questions are uh, pretty much, um, what did you carry in the jugs on deck? Did you motor through the Suez? And how did you get off the reef? OK. Uh, the uh, that's the jugs carried e uh, extra diesel and water and gasoline. Uh, so for the outboard uh, emergency water, there was a you didn't see that, but there you know they were different colors. So probably we had a, 72 gallons of diesel in our tanks, and I think we had another 18 on deck, and then six of gas and six of water. I think that's what it was. Um, as far as the Suez, you have to motor through the, no. The Suez, you're supposed to motor through, but if you have a nice pilot like we did, you're allowed to motor sail. So uh, they want to get you out of there. Same with the Suez, I mean the Panama. You have to go fast in order to make your time to go down in the afternoon. So you go up in the morning across Gatton Lake and you have to really go at a pretty good clip uh, to make it. So. Uh, they want you to do at least seven knots across the lake, which is, you know, we could do with, uh, I think we basically had full sail up in the engine, <laughs> pretty uh, throttled up pretty good, but we made it over there in time. And uh, they make you anchor overnight. If you don't, if you don't make your downtime in the afternoon, you have to stay in Gatton Lake overnight. You just anchor. Uh, in the Suez, you also have to run the engine. They tell you you can't uh, sail, but our, pilot allowed us to motor sail uh, through the Suez. Our engine, our engine died twice in the Suez Canal. We had some, we, we were being a dog by a, some kind of connection in our fuel filter that we just had not been able to track down. It had been bothering us and it would, it, it just had to die twice in the Suez Canal on one day. So we had to what we had to do was anchor, uh, bleed the diesel, and get the engine started again and take off. And luckily, our pilot was so sweet. We had really nice pilots both days. They have a, some of them have a bad reputation for wanting bakshish and so forth and being uh, surly, but we didn't have that at all. We had just the nicest ones. And the third question you asked was, how did we get off the reef? Well, um, this is in the middle of the night, of course, we're, uh, it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning, it's blowing like hell, and uh, Teresa is not a sailor. So we got out, I knew immediately what had happened. I mean, you don't, there's no mistaking it. You're on the reef, it's, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible sound. And I raced up to the, um, 
uh, bow to get try to engage the windlass. And what would happen, of course, was, uh, well, first I started the engine and I tried to drive forward. That didn't work. So then I went up and she was on the, on the uh, helm and I would tell her, give it some gas. And then I would run the uh, windlass and then the windlass would blow breaker. And then I'd run back and reset the windlass. And we went through that three or four times and I was getting pretty anxious. And then finally, the boat came free on about four, the fourth or fifth eff, eff, effort, the boat came free. But at the same time, what happened was I heard the prop hit the reef. So, you, so then <clears throat> here we are in the middle of a gale. Yeah, I mean, it's blinding rain. You can't see what's going on, middle of the night. And I didn't know if my proper rudder had been damaged. And so I messed with them for a while. Now we had to re-anchor, of course. So you, <laughs> then you can't see the other boats. You can't see what's going on. It was, uh, I didn't sleep for a couple of days after that one. I, I don't think that's unusual. Uh, that's a traumatic, <laughs> that's a traumatic thing. But uh, we had to send our prop back to the States. We put on our spare prop hired a diver because we didn't have a hookah or a dive gear, dive gear. Anyway, we all got it done and uh, we replaced the prop in Bora Bora. And finally I bought a new one, which we replaced someplace else, maybe in Greece or something. Uh, so yeah. anyway, there's, there's your answers. Okay, well, my final question is, what was your diet like? What did, you, what did the two of you eat? Uh, what? We'll I'm sorry, like, our diet? Your diet. <laughs> well, not very good. I mean, uh, Terry and I aren't very particular. And so I wasn't worried about it. I, I, we had a lot of canned goods on board. I mean, you don't have, we didn't have refrigeration. You know, we were kind of hardcore. I, we weren't hardcore. We just, I didn't want to bother with refrigeration and we didn't have a water maker. And the reason was not because we're so tough with, it's just because it's extra charging on the battery every day. And, uh, Therefore, more maintenance. You got to maintain the water maker. You got to maintain the refrigerator. Got to maintain uh, the battery level. And I just, I, I didn't think it was worth it. So, we had fresh food for about a week. We, uh, uh, we, <laughs> we had a lot of canned goods. One thing I hadn't figured on is when you go to the South Pacific, there might be little stores and they have canned goods, but they might have 20 cans of spam and 20 cans of lima beans and nothing else. I mean, that's what they got. It's not like Safeway. So, so uh, sometimes our diet wasn't all that great, but we had a bunch of pasta and a bunch of rice on board. And, uh, you know, we didn't starve. We were all right. And when we got into town, when we got into the uh, uh, ports, we would head right to the restaurant and get knee walking drunk and eat a very fine meal. That was our routine. We didn't ever drink underway. Uh, but we didn't mind having a cocktail or two once uh, once we had land. I will tell you one more story about our cuisine. Well, we caught fish, too. We caught fish, but we weren't really fishermen, but we did catch quite a, uh, quite a few. And they're big ocean fish, and we didn't have any refrigeration, and we didn't want to salt them, so we just filleted them. But that was good. And then on the way back uh, across the Atlantic, we bought a ham in... Uh, uh, I don't know, Tenerife or something. And we hung it in the cockpit. And by the time we got about two thirds of the way across, that was pretty disgusting. We threw it overboard. But that served us well for quite a while. So there Thank you, you go. That, that's great, Tony. That's just so great. All right, so we're gonna go to Gil Sanborn with a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Gil. Uh, thanks. Uh, Tony, what a great presentation. I've been about this for years from Carla and, and your book sits on, on our shelf up at the vineyard waiting for me to read it uh, when we get back there. Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about charts, but uh, what did you bring? How did you plan in terms of bringing navigation aids, charts and guides and that sort of thing? And what, what did you uh, procure along the way? Well, uh, that's a very good question, especially it gets more relevant all the time, I think. Uh, you know, there's the old saying that there's three, uh, three periods of sailing, novice, paranoid, and retired. 
and I'm in the still in the paranoid category. So I had paper charts for everything. I had five thousand dollars worth of paper charts. They were stored in the four peak in tubes, and um, we also had uh, a G. We had two GPSs, one for the ship and and one handheld, and we had a uh, some charting uh, software on the laptop C map, which was you know, uh, connected up to the GPS. <clears throat> uh, and we had also three sextants. We had a, a really nice uh, bronze sextant, and then we had two plastic ones, an expensive and a cheap Davis sextant. So we had ourselves pretty covered. We, I also know Celestial well enough so that I could have certainly done it if we had to, but it turned out we only did it for giggles, you know, I mean, we never, <laughs> it's so much, e well, I'll tell you something though, um, I still, I teach sailing and I teach navigation and my students all go, why do we have to do this stuff? We have a cell phone, you know, <coughs> you probably heard the story about this guy who <clears throat> lost his boat near uh, Wahine in the, uh, in the Society Islands because his iPad went dead. And he ran into a reef, right? And he loses his boat. Well, if you had a computer, which I'm sure you have, you know that they can crash, they can, the batteries can go dead. I wasn't going to put my life, bet my life on that. I don't care. Plus, I mean, lightning. We uh, had several close uh, encounters with lightning and a, uh, a solar um, uh, flare could take out the GPS system and Recently, uh, the Navy has started teaching all the coastal piloting stuff again and celestial because the GPS system has been hacked. So for all those reasons, uh, we always, <clears throat> our routine was to always chart out everything on paper before we left the port, all of our waypoints and everything. And uh, then the other guy would check your work. So. We never left port without having double checked our navigation. Uh, so, I mean, I guess that gives you a pretty general picture of how we did it. But uh, I enjoy the old fashioned, you know, paper uh, dividers, all that stuff. I, I like doing that. And uh, it never let us down. So, what can I tell you? We survived. You know, one of the things I say when I teach navigation is that a 99% score. On, a nav on navigation is a failing grade. It only hmm. takes one time to die. So there you go. I hope that answered it. Thank you. Very true, Tony. Uh, I just unmuted uh, Martha. She had a great comment. Oh. Uh, <laughs> hi, Tony. What I said was, you're one scary dude. <laughs> That's not usually how people see me. Yeah, it was news to me too, bro, and it's been what, 50 years? <laughs> All right, thanks, I think. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I ever need anybody to uh, be tougher than three other guys, <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, well, call me one, call me 20 years. All right, next we're going to uh, yeah. Carla Jacob. All right. Hey, Carla. Hi, I'm trying to unmute. Okay, I'm on. I hear you. Okay, Tony, um, I read your book, and I wanted to say to everybody that the humor that you see here and the detail and the historical context and the philosophical ruminations and the color, the local color, are all in the book. And... Um, I, I bring it out at parties because there's a part in the beginning uh, when the day they left and they went out the gate and the weather was rough. They, uh, they, the captain and Mr. Schrode had a vomiting contest, involuntary, that is really worth reading. I won't read it here because we're running over, but I just have to say, you know, the book is a classic sailing adventure uh, tale that is worth reading. Thank you, Carla. You're welcome. Oh, also, I was I was part of the uh, email trail when you were on the road, and I always wondered 
how you got the history of each place before you even knew where you were going. So how did you access, did you have like a wall of books that you could reference? <clears throat> um, well, I guess that's a good question. Some of it I knew, but you're right. Uh, I, I did have a big, big book bookcase on the boat. One of the great things about sailing is that you don't have to have everything in a suitcase. We had a whole bookcase. Uh, I could go back to that photo of the cabin. Maybe I can real quick. I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, let's see. So we, we had a bookcase, so I had references. I, I didn't have to, re, uh, to rely on my own memory for everything. But uh, I don't know. Maybe we had 100 books or so on board, something like that. There you go. So, um, uh, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. There's a bookcase there in the cabin. So it was nice. So I had a lot of reference books and, um, actually in those days, I mean, you don't really have internet on board, but what I did have was a, um, Oh, Oh, what'd they do? It's okay. You ended your share, but that's okay, Tony. Um, I can see more people now. I like this. Uh, anyway, I, um, I had uh, a Encyclopedia Britannica on my laptop. So that, that helped. But, and then when I got into port, sometimes I could, uh, I could access internet some places and look things up. But anyway, thank you for the question. You're welcome. All right, going to Ian Joseph. Do you have a question? Yeah, hi Tony. Um, oh, yeah. Tony, if you went today, and you've kind of hinted at it a little bit, what would you do differently? Uh, you know, that's, I'm kind of, I, I, this is, this answer is not going to sound very humble, but we got a lot of things right. I mean, for one thing, it's not a mystery how you do this anymore. The, millions of people have done it, written books on it. Uh, the kind of gear you have to have, the kind of uh, knowledge you have to have is pretty well known. You just have to study up. And I think I did my homework okay. One of the things is that nothing that Terry and I did, none of the modifications we made to the boat before we left failed. Everything that failed was uh, gear that we had bought and was, in, was of good reputation and in good shape before we left. What I would do different, I don't know, you know, every circumnavigation, if, if I went around 10 times, they'd be 10 different experiences. Uh, there was nothing we really did, believe it or not, that was, that was stupid or ill-advised. Uh, well, maybe there was stuff, like going circumnavigating was ill-advised, but uh, aside from that, maybe uh, sailing across the Atlantic without an engine was ill-advised, I don't know, but we, we got away with all that stuff. They, they were uh they were risks that we could assess and 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 uh we don't think they were reckless there, there was very little reckless uh, stuff we did so as far as gear goes there might be a few things i would not want to uh i'd want to replace but basically we had it sorted out pretty well i must say uh i can't i can't tell you something that i thought was a real bad mistake that we made That's awesome. All right, uh, one other question coming from uh, Jason O'Dell. Yes, sir. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Hi, Jason. Told you I was going to show up for this. Yeah, you did. Hey, uh, quick question. Uh, obviously, you know some of my plans. What was the uh, physical toll or any kind of conditioning you'd recommend for someone who's considering embarking on this? I can't imagine you spend as much time at sea as you did without having some... Uh, uh, physical results from it. Are you say, talking about injuries or sickness? Well, you know, there's um, taking a look at the GGR and the folks who go through extreme deprivation there. You know, obviously, you guys didn't go through that, but confined space, long period of time, you know, the differences in eating habits, all that stuff adds up over time. You know, Terry and I got along miraculously well, and that's all due to him. He's just the greatest guy in the world. And, uh, we were very complimentary to each other. You know, I was the worrier. That was kind of my job, being the worrier. And 
Terry's not a worrier. He's, he's a guy that you show him a problem and he'll address it. Um, and that worked well as, as a team. We, uh, our skills were, we both could do most things, but he tended to do some things better than me. And I don't know if I did anything better than him, but I, I did them anyway. And, uh, uh, as far as getting along, we just, we had, you know, we might have butted heads like four times in the whole two and, uh, 27 months and we're still best buddies. So all credit to Terry for that. As far as physical um, deprivations or uh, injuries, we, I think we each broke a foot. I mean, not a foot, a toe, because they tell you always on a boat to wear uh uh, something on your feet so you don't break your toes. But um, my counter argument to that is, unless you're in cold weather, uh, your feet are much better able to sense whether you're on a slippery surface than uh, your shoes are. The, your shoes don't have nerve endings on them. Your feet will know instantly that you're um, not secure. But it'll take sliding before you know it with your uh, with your tennis, uh, with your um, uh, shoes. So my, um, we both did, we just bo both went barefoot all the time and we felt secure on deck running around barefoot. And as a result, we both broke a toe. I mean, big deal. Like it's not, it, it, it so your, your foot hurts for a little while. It was, it was nothing. Other than that, Terry got sick, fairly sick a couple of times. He got dengue fever in Bora Bora and he was very sick. And then he was sick again in uh, Eritrea, uh, some stomach thing. I mean, you always worry. You're 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 not in America, you know. You can't just go down to Kaiser and uh, to the emergency room. So uh, it, I was very troubled when Terry was not up and around, uh, just worried for him. And uh, but he came out of it fine. And. I never really got sick. I think I might have gotten a couple of colds, but I was pretty healthy the whole time. We were pretty, pretty okay. We had this mammoth uh, first aid kit because I had a, I don't know what it is, it's kind of the standard uh, medicine at sea textbook or whatever. And I, uh, uh, it, there was a list of drugs and, and equipment you were supposed to have in that book. And I ran it by uh, an old friend of mine who was our doctor for the trip. He was, uh, he's an emergency room, professor of emergency medicine. And uh, I could email him anytime I wanted and he would always answer, you know, Tony, when a guy gets to be a certain age, <coughs> that would be, that would be his response. But anyway, uh, uh, he said, you're not gonna need all this stuff. And we had, I think more, well, we went, both Terry and I went down to Kaiser and talked to our doctors and they said, sure. They got, they both gave us this long list of prescription drugs. They just gave them to us and it was on our medical plan. And we had this whole uh, rack full of drugs on Maverick. I mean, I think there were some countries that had less drugs than we did. But uh, my old buddy, Frank was right. We never used anything. I mean, I, I can't remember a drug I took out of that. We also, we had a suturing kit. We had a blood pressure cuff. I mean, uh, Frank had taken uh, suturing lessons from his, uh, not Frank, Terry had taken suturing lessons from his dentist before we left. <laughs> but we just didn't hurt ourselves. Thanks, sir. That's the questions you were asking, but they're the Oh, yeah, yeah, you hit it. Answers. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that's the end of our questions. I want to thank you, Tony. I want to invite the Commodore back on for some last words. Well, Tony, thank you very much. That was terrific. Uh, I intended by the book and um, we had a great turnout as we expected. And Tony, please come to the Yacht Club for dinner. My, my pleasure to host you and yours to dinner. How's that sound? I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was uh, uh, a lot of fun. Okay, good night, sir. Good night, everybody. Stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.